Please, please just call me up. Should I don't call me sir or anything else. Uh, so I won't speak for uh, much. Uh, this is about uh, an hour session or something like that. So uh, for half of it, I'll talk to you and tell you what this is and all those things. For the other half, you can ask me questions regarding anything you want, either about this or other things. We can have this. How many of you have heard of uh, game theory? Raise your hands. So, no one, right? Yeah, that's pretty good cool because I didn't even I didn't heard of, uh, this subject. But when I was uh, in uh, there was an inspired program in my college, and uh, a very interesting professor had come from IIC to talk about this subject, and uh, I was very inspired by it. It's kind of a pity that you don't get to hear this but instead you get to me. But nevertheless, they made that point. So, uh, this is a fantastic subject, uh, so much so that it inspired me to work on this throughout. So, ever since 11th standard, the only thing I want to do is game theory. So, what is game theory actually? Uh, the name itself gives away some clues as to what it might be, but uh, let's take a so essentially, it's the science of strategic behavior, right? So we play a lot of games in our daily lives. In fact, computers, any kind of interaction is a game. Uh, it turns out the same principles can be used in economics, in computer science, and various other places, where two people or more people or literally any number of agents are coming together and interact. And every such scenario can be studied with frameworks using uh, game theory. So game theory as a subject, as a, as a rigorous academic discipline, lies at the intersection of computer science and economics. So it started out as something that was literally the child of these two subjects. And uh, let's take a look at the rest. So, you may have uh, seen this page, it's probably one of the most uh, famous pages that you've seen. So you search anything in Google, it shows up a lot of results, a lot of organic results down below. But even before that, it shows you a bunch of ads. And uh, smart ones amongst you would have used ad blockers and blocked away most of these ads. Nevertheless, uh, you want most people to see these ads. And in fact, it turns out these ads or ads like this are uh, the main source of Google's revenue. 84% of Google's revenue comes from these ads. And that is 84% of 136 billion. So what's so interesting about these ads? So here I've searched laptop and you can see a bunch of laptops being uh, advertised. And uh, you'll see here that it shows it's sponsored. Which means that these companies, Lenovo, HP and others, have paid Google put their products before everybody else's, you know, because uh, some of the people that see their first thing, be inspired by the world. So there comes a question as to who gets to show their products, you know. Google can't choose just randomly, you know, I'll put them or oh, I'll put HP or whatever. So it turns out this is a very interesting question. Uh, uh, so, who do you think gets to put their products here? Yes. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, as Google, well, what's my incentive to put something there? To make money, right? I mean, what else are we doing there? Yeah, as Google, not me. So, yeah, who pays highest essentially gets to put their ads here. But this problem is even more interesting. It's not just who pays highest. We'll, we'll take a look at it later. So, uh, why is this under the end thing? Can anybody tell me? Maybe you can answer that question later. Uh, it's an interaction amongst a lot of agents, so let's see how it So, this subject started out uh, with these two people. Have you heard of this name, John Von Oyen? Anybody heard of him? So, he's considered one of the like most of the father of modern computer science. He is uh, prime was somewhere in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so something from the 20s to 60s. He did a lot of work. And he and 
and this other person called Oscar Marvinster, who was an economist, come together and write this book called Theory of PMC and Economic Behavior in 1944. And this starts off the most uh, vigorous foundations. This lays down those foundations of this subject. But we still haven't really looked at what the subject is, you know, the core of it, the meat of this. So let's take uh, three very interesting examples of how games are, what, what do we mean by games as such. The first one is called the cake cutting problem. And uh, this is very interesting. This uh, is one of the most simplest forms of resource allocation problems. So consider this uh, problem. There is a mother and uh, there are two kids. And there is a cake which the mother needs to cut and give it to her kids. And you know, kids will be kids uh, no matter how precisely the mother cuts the cake, no matter how well she wants to balance out and give equal proportions to the kids. Each kid will feel that the other guy got a bigger piece. Right? It's quite natural. Even when we were kids, we did the same thing. We were all slightly envious of the other person. You know? That's as always as we learn this. So this is a very interesting problem. How do you tackle such a problem? What can the mother do to ensure this thing called envy freeness? So what does envy free mean? It means one party shouldn't feel that the other person got a better deal. Anybody wants to take a shot what do you mean? To solve this problem. You cut a cake so perfectly that each person should feel that he got a good piece. He got a bad piece. Yeah, that's a, that's a regular answer. But how, how, who, uh, okay, so what happens is if you let them cut the cake, what do you mean by them? Them as one entity? Or like, do you just give them the knife and say you find it out? So, refine your answer. They won't believe you, they're kids, man. <laughs> you believe your parents when they said, you know, all the things that they said are going to get. <laughs> so refine, refine the answer. That's a very good answer. That's how it goes. But how do you like to do it? Somebody from the side. Somebody from the middle. You give them to share among themselves. Yeah, but how? That, that, that's the question. You're here. So when you say something like that, that's a good answer. Uh, you have a good vision in mind as to what should be achieved. But you have to think imperatively as to how to achieve. So now refine your answer even more. A few more minutes and then you will see how do How do you do this? We know exactly what needs to be done. When we give the cake to them, uh, they will be satisfied that they have done the cake in the way and they will be Okay, so cutting is a process in the north of self So if you so they start to fight amongst how to cut it or where to cut it or those kind of things. So refine it more, that's a good answer. Give them separately so that they will not know how much the other person wants. That's a good answer and uh, also, so this thing is used in some places uh, where uh, things are, the setting is so sealed and isolated that one person doesn't even know what the other person wants. But uh, it's outside our model. Here, they are kids, kids of home, you know, everybody has seen the thing. And uh, we'll make this idea more rigorous in the time. But let's see, more answers. Come on, we can do The clue is there. He gave a clue. It's, uh, it's a very good clue. They do the cutting, but how do they do it exactly? So, uh, one more minute and they take wild shots, you know, you, you lose nothing for them. This is your chance. Take the wildest game. <laughs> so this answer is very interesting. In economics, there are, there are, there are certain... Uh, so, you know, government, when it allocates resources, there, there are a lot of deep questions that, that uh, they try to ask. Oh, how do you allocate resources? One of the answers is, the person who needs it should get it. But if I tell you that, uh, you know, like, hey, what's your best, uh, most favorite for me? Okay, but uh, 
how about simpler ones and how about computer games? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fine, yeah. So if I tell you that nobody gets to play football except for that one super guy who is going to national strike. Okay. It's not good, right? Because see, by the way, I said the person who deserves the most to play at the ones, you know, he needs to practice. But if I tell you that should get all the resources. Okay. So that is not MV3. So even though I got a lower, smaller piece, even though I have a bigger brother, I still feel MV. That is what we're going to So the answer is very interesting and they will take it. So you tell one of the kids to or make a deal with the kids that one of you cut it, the other one chooses which piece to take. So this is quite interesting. So can you get it? There are two kids, A and B, right? Arjun and... What's that? So, Arjun, you cut the cake, okay? However you want. Doesn't matter. Literally doesn't matter. Cut it, cut it like a thin piece and a huge section, right? It really doesn't matter. But, your brother gets to pick the first piece, whichever it is. So how do you make this sure any So you all feel that this is a very interesting answer, right? But how, how does it uh, how does it help with NVP? This is a very very defined setting in of NVPs. It's a large research content. So you as the first person who is going to cut the cake. You won't get to choose which piece you are going to get first, okay? How will you cut it? You will cut it equally, right? Equally is again interesting here. You will cut it equally in the sense equal to you, not for the other guy. You know, it doesn't matter how the other guy feels. You know, as long as both the pieces are equal to you, and another way of saying this is as long as you are indifferent to which piece the other person chooses, you are happy, right? Because since you have cut the cake, no matter which piece I take, you are envy free in the sense that you know no matter which piece I take since I have cut the cake. It doesn't matter to me. I'll cut it so precisely that no matter how shrewdly my brother picks the piece, I still have the piece for myself. So you as a cutter are envy free. How, how, how does the chooser become envy free? Exactly, yeah, it's a, it's a dumb question. He gets to choose. He gets to choose the biggest piece that he thinks is the biggest. So uh, this is one of the interesting problems of what a game truly is. So uh, this is a crux of game. Just to look at examples like this and you know, to indulge yourself in the intellectual activity looking at such examples. But it doesn't stop here. Uh, there are much, much better examples and uh, take a look. So everybody understood this. I cut a new choose policy. So then we come to uh, we come to this question. So what exactly is a game? So what is a game? So if I ask you, uh, tell me the most common terms that you know. Don't don't bring up any technical things. We don't have to bother about any of that. So if I ask you, what is a game? How do you answer? Take a shot. Sorry? Games are fun? Yeah. Games should be fun. Yes, I A person playing should be fun. What guy are you? A person can enjoy while playing. A person can enjoy while playing. While playing. So, since it's fun. It's there should be enjoyable. Okay, what else? What else? Hey, you can just throw words in the air, or right? Shoot blindly. It's fine. Time pass. Time pass. Time pass. Time pass. Time pass. Okay. Not a time. What else? Entertaining. Interesting. 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 Okay, so you are talking about what a game should be, right? What are the aspects of 
and game design. You know, if you're going to design a game, you have things like that. But what is a game? Okay. What constitutes a game? Not what, uh, what properties it should have. Okay. What are the desirable aspects of a game? Forget about that. What is a game? You know, it has winners and losers. Okay. But it's. Gaming and it's a play thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, it's a play thing. What is it? Rewards. It has rewards. It's a play thing. That's it, yeah. Games have rewards. Rewards have nothing. Competition. Yeah, it's a competitive setting. That's what it is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, what is it? Yeah, no, this is a setup. It's a setup. Go on, go on, go on. One last shot. And gain knowledge. You were just saying, man. Gain knowledge. Gain knowledge? No, those are desirable properties. It's nice if a game gives you knowledge. But you know, some games don't. What knowledge do you gain from rock paper scissors? You don't gain a lot of knowledge. 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 So, you come to understand this world in all its glory, I mean, you literally do not have enough confidence You cannot keep in your memory every possible motion of every atom around you and you know, model the whole universe and it's confused you are That's not possible. So, we abstract out most details and make simple models. That, in essence, is most of what economics is. So, in the same sense, games are also modern. You can't, you can't completely describe a chess match from you know how the hand which of each player and stuff like that. You forget about all those, you write down the whole game and also just you know rope to e4 and stuff like that. So games are modeled also in very abstract and simple ways. We look at two particular game models. One is called the strategic farm uh, games. And the other is called the extensive form game. Right. So the words are a bit confusing as well, so you can use it. But we'll get about that for the audience. So one the model of a game is where each player moves simultaneously, like rock, paper, scissors. Right? If Aki and I are playing, we both move at the same instant in fact. Okay? But if we are playing chess, we move sequentially. I play first, and he plays, he plays next, and then I play. And it goes on and on and on. So whenever we have sequential gameplay, we monitor it using sensor objects. It's one of the ways how you can do it. There are a lot of other models, but we take a look at these for the index. So uh, first we look at the uh, we are you know it's uh, intro lecture, we don't have to So you just see what an extensive form game is for. So if you have tic tac toe, the entire game can be written out as a tree. So the first move is somewhere there, and the next move is, you know, we have three moves here, we open the move and the player is on the and so on and so on and so on, but three grows and grows and grows, and uh, you know, the entire sequence of moves can be mapped. So these are the what are called extensive form games. So there isn't much time to use, so we'll move on to a better example, a more interesting example. Right? So we need to simultaneously move. So those are more interesting uh, for an intro lecture. So before we move on to how a simultaneous game can be rigorously modeled academically, let's look at some key aspects which are there. And this will give us some uh, intuition behind what a game truly is. But before that, should a game really be fun? Like can, can that aspect be removed from games? No? Like, are you, are you ready to play games which aren't fun? No, no, no. But if I model your final exams as a game, <laughs> that certainly won't be fun. Like, I have never written a fun final exam in my life. But nevertheless, it would 
be a game. As a model, it will be a game. The game is very simple. The one who gets the highest number of three marks wins. Gets the first man. So games needn't always be fun. And many interactive scenarios, many strategic situations in the world can be not at all. We may take a look at more examples later, but keep in mind that the desirable properties of games need exactly be what you think how is that, you know, we will take a look at this one, but we will get back to this one easily. So one is, games, when we talk about games here, it's mostly where there are more than one player playing the game. But we have single player games also, right? Yeah. What's the most uh, common example for one player? So, Candy Crush also has two players in the sense your mobile phone is a player who is playing against you. You are playing against an environment which can be modeled as another player. What, can you think of a game where there is no other player, there is just one player? Any single player In that sense, they are rational. 
and they are also intelligent. So what is an intelligent player meaning? It means that he is a game player. So it means that he knows everything about the game there is to be known. Otherwise our models become much harder. So but we just assume that he knows everything there is to be known. And he knows exactly how to play the game and how to compute his best response strategy. What is the best response strategy in play? What is the best response strategy? So in rock, paper, scissors, I have played rock. Okay. And you know I have played rock. What will you play? Paper, right? That is your best response strategy. Okay. In, uh, in hand cricket, let's say I have batting, I have put a 6. What's your best response strategy? It's a 6. So your best response strategy is that play or that action that you choose to beat me, okay, which is in your best interest. If you have an exam coming up, what's your best response strategy? Good evening. 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 And you don't even know that there exists something called paper. For you there are just rock and scissors. And for me there is rock, paper, scissors. I obviously gave it to you. Right? I have more uh, players to make. If I know what you're going to play, I'll play better. And uh, if you know what I'm going to play next, you'll play better. But that uh, kind of models up to what it means is, if there is a fact that is known in the game, and if you are to call it common knowledge, it means uh, you know that I know that fact. Okay. So in rock, paper, scissors, there are three actions. Rock, paper, and scissors. And this is common knowledge. What is it? It means that if you and I are playing, you know that I know that three actions exist. And I know that you know that three actions exist. And you know that I know that you know that three actions exist. So everybody knows that everybody is aware of everything in the game. Okay, that is common knowledge. Very interesting definition. So you know, so here the first and it goes on to the every player knows that every player knows that everybody is going to cheat. But you know, that's that common knowledge. Everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody is going to cheat. Keep it common. So this goes on for this is common. So keep these in mind. These are interesting, right? But we need these in the future when we look at more interesting. Another thing is uh, there are what are called preferences. This is what is meant by there are you know there are skills, competency, and all that. So uh, when I get into a game, I know exactly what I want. Okay? I want one particular outcome more than other outcomes. If you're playing chess, what outcome would you want? So preference of check made is very high. What's the lowest preference? Not to be checked, it ought to be first. That means the game can go on forever. The, the, the lowest preference will be first design. Not just not to be checkmated, but the lowest preference will be to be checkmated by the other. That's the most least preferred outcome. So these uh, preferences can be ranked. What is the second best thing that can happen? Check. Yeah. Check. Yeah, you will check the other person. So what is the third best thing? Defending. Say again? Defending. Defending. Okay. We defend our things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in this sense, there are a lot of outcomes. Check mates, check stair mates, defense. Okay. To lose the game is the lowest preference. A draw is somewhere in the middle and stuff like that. So every preference can be ranked as a preference relationship, right? So in every game that you play, you can rank these preferences. And when you are modeling the games, you make it to uh, assumption that these things are already ranked. Okay? And then we have something called as payoffs. And these are numbers assigned to those preference rankings, such that these numbers reflect the So what does it mean? It means if you and I are playing uh, chess, 
you can take the utility of you checkmating me to be 10, you can take the utility of the next thing to be 9, and so on and so forth. By these numbers, they imply that the, the ordinal order of reference relations is shown in those numbers. That is what is meant by it. So, if you're playing a game which involves money, essentially you can use that money and that value of it. That is it. And game have. If there is no money involved, you can use a lot of numbers to represent it. So, let's take a look at this kind of game. So, who are the players? Uh, no, those are the actions. It's not on that. It will be anyone. It's not a good person. Can be anyone. There are two players who are playing on the person. What are the actions of each player? At each instant. So we are modeling only one instance here, okay? There is just one move. It's a one shot game, it's a simultaneous game. And uh, the actions available are not So I have given utility uh, utilities or uh, payoffs as this. If I put scissors and the other guy puts rock, I lose the round and he wins the round. So I have assigned numbers from this one. If we both put the same thing, neither of us wins, neither of us wins, so it's a right? So you can see that this maps out the utilities of each uh, uh, you know each round in the game. So this matrix of uh, utilities kind of models the game, right? This is a model of game theory. This precisely is what is called a strategic form game. A strategic form game is a model which has players and the players have actions and when these actions are played there are outcomes in the game and each outcome has payoffs for each player. This is a strategic form game. So we look at an interesting strategic form game called prisoner's dilemma. So you know have you heard of this paper Al Capone? Uh, yeah, very, very uh, notorious gangster. He was in the 20s of the Chicago gangster. Yeah. This guy was some, possibly one of the most notorious gangsters in America. And when, and when they caught him, he was so ridiculous and he had paid off a lot of people. I don't know how he managed it, but they couldn't convict him of all the bad things that they done, but they killed people, wrong bad things. They couldn't convict him. In fact, they ended up convicting him on tax events, tax fraud, essentially. They made a lot of money, they would pay taxes. And, uh, you know, they're going to send you to jail. They couldn't convict him for wrong bad things that they done. So why am I telling you this? So let's look at a very interesting thing. So there are two prisoners away. Yeah. There are two prisoners and they have just robbed the bank. <laughs> they are, there is a huge chase going on, a very fast and furious chase, a very car running around, all kinds of action going on. They get caught, like the police win. Unlike the movies. <laughs> so, yeah. Police win and they have been caught and they have been brought to the police station. They have, the police aren't able to prove that they have robbed the bank. Okay. They are very smart criminals. So they have been caught, but they are not able to do that. They are not able But the police have found uh, evidence with, uh, I think, about forensic accounting and all of that. I don't know. A lot of, uh, they do a lot of accounting gymnastics. And they have found out that uh, they have charges of tax evasion okay, these days. And the police can definitely convict them. At least two years, you are going behind the bars. Okay. But the police want to convict them not for tax evasion but for robbing the bank. Because that's what a good police force is like. That's the key. Want to put the way behind bars for the worst thing that is. But the police don't have enough evidence. They want to put them behind bars. 
there be questioned in separate rooms. Okay, each guy has been put in two separate rooms simultaneously. They have been given ten minutes. He is in one room, the other guy is in the other room. They cannot communicate. Each guy doesn't know what the other guy is going to do. And the police guy comes and he puts a deal in front of each person. Yes. So the thing is this. You can either confess or you cannot confess. Okay? Your friend is in the other room. Okay? He is not going to be your friend. You, you, you are caught. You are definitely going to prison for two years on tax evasion charges. So, there is no way you are going to escape that. But I will give you a team. You know, we know that you have dropped the bag. This is we are not able to prove it. Okay, but that doesn't mean you didn't do it. You definitely did it at a moment. You are going to be there for that. But, you know, the courts, they want to, or they want a confession. They want a confession, sorry. So what you do is, you confess. Tell us that you have done the problem. Okay? We will provide you leniency. Okay, you can go home, no problem. We go home, take it. We will put the other way behind us for 10 years. Okay. Because he didn't confess, right? He's not your friend, man. Go on, think rationally for yourself. Okay. So, you in that instant, well, God forbid, you are not the but just think you are correct. It's a fun thing to do. So, you have to make that decision at that moment. Okay. Simultaneously, the other guy is in the other room making the exact same decision. And this whole game is common knowledge, okay? You know that the police have given the same deal to it. Okay, I am telling you this, this is drop proof. Okay? Don't question this, okay? This is the model, alright? This is what has happened. You as a criminal in one room know this. You know that the other guy knows this. You know that the other guy knows that you know this. And so on and so on and so on. You know that he knows that he knows that. So on and on and on, okay? Everybody knows everything. The game is transparent. Everything is common knowledge. This is the deal that is being put in the First thing, if you don't confess and the other guy doesn't confess, we will put you behind bars for tax evasion. Two years behind bars, definitely. Okay? If you confess and even the other guy confesses, ten years behind the bars. But we'll give you three years, you know, we'll reduce your sentence with little leniency because you know you you made the job easier for the litigators and public prosecutors and all that. So you know you immediately be sentenced to jail and we'll give you a little leniency, you will be put behind bars for seven and seven years. Okay. You confess and the other guy doesn't confess. We will provide you complete uh, leniency, you can go home, we put the other guy behind bars. He confesses and you don't confess, you are in big trouble. Because he tells the police that you guys are definitely off the bank. So no, the money is in my house, please go take it. Put the other guy behind bars, I don't care, send me one. So this is a deal you okay? And everybody gets this deal. Did you, do you think you have understood this deal? Yeah? Perfect. Okay. What do you think is the outcome? If they are smart enough, both of you not take the most Okay. <laughs> if they are smart enough, both of them will not tell us. Any other option? Any refinements, any other answers? Shout your answer. This is your chance. No, no, no. Good. 40 minutes. We don't have much time, sir. There are a lot of other examples. One will confess and put the other one in. What is the total of? They can communicate and everything. 
Nobody rats anybody out. Okay, four years sir. Yeah. Two plus two. In man of nine years, it's four years. If we both end up something, it's fourteen years. Four years, fourteen years. So net thing we reduce. We don't get this. So in that sense, if they can follow, if they can cooperate, they should be. But you know, they're in separate rooms. Can't communicate. And they're saying cooperate. What do you think of that? So some people are saying both will confess. Some people are saying both won't confess. How many are both will confess? Both, uh, both will confess. One, two, uh, there, there was a three, four, five. Take your bets, man. It's a free game, right? Nobody's going to have money. Five, yeah, four people, all right? So let's say it's like a 20%, 80%. 20% of you believe that both will confess. And 80% uh, of you believe that both will not confess, or is there anyone who one will confess and the other will be one. That's one of them. So essentially these three are the outcomes. Are there any other outcomes? Here, don't think of extraneous outcomes like, you know, he's a very smart criminal, he'll figure out how to escape through the window. <laughs> 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 uh, figure a smart Let's take Ideally, if they were extremely smart colluding criminals, this would be the outcome. It's a very natural thing to say. If they were cooperative, if they were a single entity, if you had to choose, you would just choose this. It has the least amount of bang years that are spent in the But it's very interesting. You see, how does a selfish agent think? Okay. I, a criminal, I'm sitting in that room, immediately I have to make a decision. So this is called the rope player, this is called the column player, okay? I don't know what he's going to do. I can just choose this. And in turn, he choose that. And my choice isn't enough. His choice also matters what kind of thing you are okay? So if I choose to not confess, I will get these out. If I choose to confess, I will get these. Let's say, Scenario number one, he doesn't confess. What's the best thing for me to do? Confess? No, 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 he is not confessing. Not confessing. Zero punishment, which is better. Would you serve two years behind bars or would you go? Exactly, right? If he is not confessing, if you are completely dead sure that he is not confessing, you will confess. Exactly. If he is confessing, scenario number two. You will confess. Why do you confess? Because of 10 years behind bars is much better than 10 years behind bars. Exactly. So confessing becomes a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is something which is your best response strategy. Irrespective of what the other guy does. So this is a very interesting game. You think ideally nobody confesses, but it turns out each one plays a dominant strategy and both of them end up confessing. Both of them go to jail. This is a very strange and uh, counterintuitive outcome of the game. This in turn happens to be the equilibrium of the game. What does an equilibrium mean? It means if both of them are playing this, nobody has an incentive to change his, okay, his actions. This is not an equilibrium. Why is it not an equilibrium? The rope player would, sorry, the column player would rather confess and get seven years in jail. So he will shift his action. So it is not an equilibrium. A game is an equilibrium. If people who are playing the game as such continue to play the game as such, okay, nobody changes their mood. Okay, that is an equilibrium. Because for a few of you it's hard that both of them will better for each of them. So do you think that these equilibriums always exist? It's a very hard question. This we got a Nobel Prize for answering that question. So anyways. 
This way is called John Nash. There is a very nice film made about this. Like it's called a beautiful film. If you want, you can go to it. So anyway, we won the Nobel Prize in 1994. All the finite strategic games have an equal effect. Okay. So what is a finite game? So uh, the finite game is where number of players are finite, number of actions that they have are also finite, the number of outcomes are finite. So, so but the equilibrium that he talks about is uh, even more more, it's, it's a more general kind of thing to fly that makes people a bit different. So, you know, choosing one outcome is part of pure strategy. Okay? If you have a probability distribution over these, it's called a mixed uh, For example, uh, you know, in uh, rock, paper, scissors, you randomly put rock, paper, and scissors in equal proportion. That is a mixed strategy. In the sense, you mix up your players over time. So, if you allow for mixed uh, strategies, it turns out that every game has a level. It's not clear as to where, what that level is. People think that is a hard, hard level. Uh, but it turns out people have different stages. At least one is the way that it's So, now we come to a very uh, uh, nice question. You know, you guys study science and math and everything, right? So after a while you begin to wonder why are we doing all this? Some of you will answer you know it's fun. There is an intellectual pleasure in involving yourself in such an enterprise. But there are a few of you who think, no, no, you know, just studying things and giving it to you is just not good. We need to use those models that we have learned in order to build the things to achieve something we want. Right? And that is the entire enterprise of engineering, right? More or less. Most of technology is just that way. Using things that you know to build things that you want. Okay. So can you do the reverse with games? Okay. That's the question. So you have studied game theory all your life. You, know, you have come up with brilliant models of how games exist in the real world. How do people behave? How do agents behave? And now you want to design games such that you want the people to behave in ways that you want them to behave. Where do these kinds of scenarios come up? Where do you think of such scenarios? I know it sounds very diabolical, you know, making people behave how they want them to behave. But no, there are very nice examples. Can you think of some places where you want people to behave? Can you think of some places where you want people to behave? fact that I have left out. I told you it's computer science and economics and some of, these, some of those things have come into the picture as of now. So we'll see all the but things like outside of normal games. Think about any strategic interaction where you would want certain things. Any answers? Exactly, being the captain of a particular team, you want people to behave as a team, as a unit. Like if you guys play basketball, you know the interests of the team are to be put above your own interests. If you lose, if you lose every match, but you score the highest number of baskets as an individual, I mean, what's the use? Right? We have seen a lot of cricket matches, right? I mean, the batsman keeps scoring centuries for himself, but the team ends up losing it. Right? So, as a captain, you want the team to behave as a team. That's a good example. Which was a hard model, right? How to model the entire you know, behavior of the team. It's not all that easy. Nevertheless, good example. Any other examples? Yeah? So, this question, in fact, is uh, very interesting. And another whole subject by mechanism design has come into picture. Just like it. And this is the exact reverse of game theory. This is game theorists looking at games and wanting to design social situations, scenarios, such that they want to elicit some kind of behavior. 
some kind of information from the text. These three guys, Eric Maskin, Roger Myers, and Ed Roberts, these guys won uh, Nobel in 2007 for coming up with chemicals. Uh, well, uh, they laid down the theoretical foundations for this. So, mechanism design is reverse engineering. It's the reverse of it. You know the game you want to make a game. What is game theory? You don't know how they behave and you want to find out how they behave. Okay. So, let's see where is this is. One of the things is auctions. Okay. What is an auction? Bidding, yeah, exactly. You do a bidding in an auction. What is an auction? There we say a lot of people coming together. But so an auction is essentially where you want to either sell something or buy something. Okay. You know governments uh, give out these things called tenders. Yeah. Right. So government wants to build a building or something, and there are a lot of builders, and the government puts out a tender saying, "You present your costs, I pick the guy that I want to build." Okay. This is a kind of a procurement auction. The government wants to purchase, you know, 500 tractors to give away to the farmers in need. So it puts out a tender to tractor manufacturing companies, you know, give us your best uh, watts in the area. So that is procurement. Kind of. Those are also kind of options. But what is the most common option that we have? The normal bidding kind of auction, right? I am selling something, you open the bids, one guy says 10, is it 10? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, this is called an English auction. This is the most famous auction. Property auctions, livestock auction, all of these go on. Another thing is called a Dutch auction. So this is a descending auction. So this started out in the Netherlands when they started uh, selling flowers. They quoted a very high nice price. It's 10,000 rupees for this cup of tea. Nobody wants to buy 9,000 rupees. Nobody for it, for it. 15 rupees who wants to buy. I saw some of people raise your hand. <laughs> and then I sent it to you. The first guy who raises his hand, I sent it to you. So this is a descending auction. Okay. So why am I talking about auctions? Why is this a game? Or is it a game? Why is it a game? Exactly, it is an interaction of selfish people, selfish agents, or rather self interest Any kind of interaction is a game. It can be modeled as a game. Some are hard, some are easy. But they can be modeled as a game. Okay. Auctions are fantastic ones. Because, I showed you those ads, right? Every time you search a keyword in Google, there is a real-time ad which runs in the background uh, for such keyword. And once that auction is run, the outcomes of those auctions, the winners, they get to place their ads first. And then the next uh, things, you know, first is the normal, second is the first. So this happens in real-time, and those ads are shown. And for each ad, that you click. Google gets a tiny amount of revenue. I think it's in fractions of cents or something. But so billions and billions of people are clicking it through days and days and years together that annual revenue is a total of like in the billions, like hundreds of billions. So most of internet economy is running on such kinds of sponsored search options. So today, all the billions of dollars in the internet economy, the majority, about 84% of Google's revenue comes from auctions. Mechanism design has been the single largest monetary output of Google and it's traded. What's the most uh, cutting edge thing that you can think of? The product, AI, and technology. Well, fantastic uh, pursuits, but when it comes to pure monetary output, no single theory has produced so much you know, impact on how much money these companies are making and sponsors. These are fantastic models. Another, uh, well, we look at one particular thing called the seed bid second price auction because it's very interesting. Because this time, the whole price is coming over there. It's hard. So, anyway, victory auction, how is this different? 
the option that we know. How much more time do I have? No problem. Yeah. You can take 11. Half an hour? Yeah. Okay. Till 11 you have to take. I know, but I want some time to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah. We look at this thing. So, the option that we know. First price, open bid. Open option, English option. We all know this. There is another thing called the Dutch option which we do. It's the design. But there are some people who see the bid options. What are these? So, let's say you are all the bidders. What I do is instead of opening up the bids, I tend to write your uh, bids on a piece of paper, seal it up, and then give it to me. I'll go home and open the envelope. They all say, you don't know what we are the way bidding. I'll go home, I'll open the envelope. And I look at the bids and allocate the, uh, the model. So those are the same bid options. Where one person doesn't know what the other person is doing. Is this a simultaneous meeting? Yes or no? Yes, it's a unanimous yes. Everybody says yes? Anybody who says no? Nobody? Okay, yeah, fantastic. It is a simultaneous meeting. Okay. Why? Everyone is bidding together. Is an open bid, uh, sorry, an open bid, uh, open assigned in English option uh, simultaneous? No. No. Exactly. And also, there is a sequential bid. It's a time One day it bids, the other day it bids. This is a simultaneous bid. Okay. So, the sealed bid first price option is very simple. It just means I get all your bits, I open the envelopes. Who has bid the highest? I just see. Some dude somewhere has bid 10,000 rupees for a couple of things. Mine are right, yeah, fantastic. Okay, you pay me 10,000 bucks, take care of Okay, that is the first price in the auction. Okay, I open the envelopes. Highest bidder wins the auction. But he pays whatever he has bid. Okay, no, no, no gymnastics. But this way, he proved another threat of auction to be very nice. But this is called the second price in the auction. So what happens is, you are giving the bids in your envelopes. I go home, open the envelopes. I find that one person has won the auction. She has won the auction, she will get that coin. Whatever it is, laptop, paint, uh, which will be in auction, anything. Okay. Eyes, she wins the option, but she pays the second highest bid. Okay. And why is this investment She pays the second highest bid. So how does it work? If there are four people who have valuations for a company, let's say, four people who have valuations for a company, they have submitted some bids. They needn't be their valuations. They have submitted some bids. I open the bids. Somebody has bid 40 rupees. She wins the she wins the bid. She wins the auction. But she pays the second highest bid. So somebody else has bid 20 rupees and she's the second highest. So she, the person pay, who has bid 40 wins the auction, but she pays the second highest. This is the second price option. You understood the model? Okay. What's so great about this? Why is it? Why why do you pay well in the price? So yeah. So for that, we'll, we'll model this uh, thing more detailed. So first, we talk about something called valuation. Okay? What is a valuation? A valuation is what you think okay, the product is truly worth. Okay? It is not dependent on every, anybody else. Okay? This is, uh, you can think of it as a given factor. If you are born with an inherent knowledge of how much that property costs, okay? or how much that painting costs, or whatever. Or, you know, a flash of genius, yesterday night you were sitting and suddenly your valuation for that painting is 31,000 for the flats. It's painting. So, valuation is your private information. Nobody else knows how much you value that painting. Because if you tell the, uh, the auctioneer, what will I do? If you just tell me your valuation. I don't want to sell it to you for any lower price. Okay? I know you are ready to pay with me all. Why would I want to sell it to you for any loan? So you will never tell your valuation to anybody. Okay, this is private information. Do you understand this? Correct. Good. 
So valuations are private. Valuations are inherent to you know them. These are the two key aspects of valuations. Now comes the bids. These are separate from valuations. Bids are what you truly pay. So we use this word and we will see how these go. So there are four uh, people on it. Arjun, Bhim, Shota Bhim and Doremon. <laughs> okay, yeah. So they are trying to buy, what can you say, a pen. Alright. Uh, it can be a really bad pen, so we can call it 14 rupees, 20 rupees. It can be a golden pen, 14 max, 20 rupees. Doesn't matter. Alright. Not in the same. So the valuations of each of these are uh, 14, 22, 28, and 21. Okay. These are uh, this is numbers that I have chosen. These can be any in the real world. So what are uh, how are they going to pay? So if these are the valuations, there are four people. If it's an English auction, how will they pay? So I have English auction, but I know bit, know bit zero. What's the most? So it says 10 equals 20, then you pay. 10 equals 15. 20 equals 15, alright. So as soon as we say 15, somewhere here, what happens to 8? 8 drops. 8 drops. Okay. And then it goes to 16, 17, 18, 19, 19.1, 19.11, 19.001, 19.001. It's so hard, man. It's all of those things. You can cut one and have some small pieces. Yeah, it goes on. As soon as it reaches 22, what happens? B is ready to buy up slightly more than 22. B drops. Why does B drop? More than its value. What happens if you spend more money than you are ready to spend upon something that you should put loss? Loss. It's a loss, exactly. You will lose money. If you spend 30 rupees on something you think is 20 rupees, you will lose 8 rupees, exactly. So, your uh, payoff is, you know, essentially your, how much you pay minus how much uh, it costs, your, uh, how much it costs to your value, right? Or uh, let's take the modules of the okay. So if you pay more than you value, yeah, so if you value the product at 22 rupees and you pay 20 rupees, your payoff is 2 rupees. Yeah, it's a profit. Well paid. So in that sense, your payoff is payoff price. So this is what happens in the uh, So in a, in a first price seed bid auction, what happens? Everybody has such valuations, but they will end up bidding more than they have. So what's so great about second price seed bid auction? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it means they take who but they actually don't. There's a theorem called the resolution revenue equivalence theorem, which says that all auctions give out the same revenue for the auction. But actually, that's a good uh, thing. Initially, you feel that second bit auction actually gives you the most uh, revenue. That's not the key thing there. So a better thing happens, which is that in a second uh, price seed bid auction, these guys will actually end up bidding whatever they value. The true evaluation which they have. It turns out that the best response strategy of the bidders is to just simply close their eyes and give their evaluation. Why is that? We'll take a look. Okay? So they have bid the same things, whatever their their valuation is. So D has bid 21, C has bid 28, and If it's a first price option and they have bid their two valuations, is it the best response strategy of B to bid this? He is bidding 31, he is paying 31. First price, uh, first price option. Is it your best response strategy? No. What can you do? You go lower. Yeah. You go lower than. Does that make sense? First price option. You pay what you bid. Will you end up bidding 31? No. 
build on it. So it turns out in a lot of real world situations we want to know their true value. How much their value is. We want to elicit this private information. I told you nobody wants to tell their valuations, right? But I as an auctioneer can force them to give out their valuations. In such a way that I will design a game precisely as a second price function wherein you are forced to give out your valuations. Why are you forced? We'll take a look. If B is uh, between 20 to 1, you know, now we are talking about second price options. This is slightly confusing. So, we will go step by step. Let's say we are talking about second price options. They are bidding their true valuation. Why are you bidding your true valuation? Because if you overbid or underbid, you are at a loss. Why are you at a loss? Let's see. If C is underbid, and let's say everybody has bid their true valuations. Everybody is, except for C. Let's say G underbids 20. Does the result of the game change? It does because B ends up being Okay, second price option. Let's make this clear. Then, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, let's make this a 26. Okay, now uh, B ends. B ends up being the biggest one. That's good. So, second price option. Highest bidder wins but she pays the second highest. Okay. If C underbids, does it change the outcome for C? Yes or no? No. Because, you know, nothing is happening to C. Yeah, he's not even paying to watch up. If C overbids by 40, what happens? Yeah. Exactly, he pays more than his valuation. He is at a loss. Okay. Overbidding is bad for you in second price options. What happens if D underbids? Let's say this. Does it change D's offer? Yes. Uh, exactly. Right? Yes. He doesn't win the option. You know, he, he valued it at 50 So if he is walking out without giving, he would rather, you know, bid more, let's say 29, and still be more. But we need to know that he doesn't know what the other person bid. So what's his best thing to do? Exactly, he just bid what he knows. He just bids his true valuation. So this way, William Wifri, he proved Mathematically, of course, in general case, that overbidding is bad and underbidding is bad. Okay. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Is underbidding bad for me? No. Is underbidding bad for it? No. No. Because it doesn't change the outcome of the game, it doesn't change the outcome of the game. Yeah. But A doesn't know that he is here. He doesn't know the valuation of the He could have been, you know, 8, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Okay. Then would underbidding change the game for it? Yes. So you don't know what the game is going to be. You don't know the valuation. What's the best thing that you can do? Maybe your two values. Exactly. So, V3 options are second price options, and these are used in the neighborhood. In fact, even the Google options, they are uh, they use something called the generalized second price options. You know, slightly more sophisticated ones. But the idea is there. The idea that if you make the payment to be the second highest, you can force people to bid their So, this is why if you have V3, it is a Nobel Prize. This along with more of his contributions. Right? He showed that bad to overbid is bad to underbid in this kind of function. In an English auction, or that sort of people can react. There are a few behavioral constraints there, but it's not as nice as a auction. Can someone tell me why is it so important 
for the auction year, we finish it in value. Yes, but they are not paying that anyway, so what's the issue? <coughs> yeah, well it has something to do with profit but not really. Uh, so it turns out, it does not be lost. Well, yeah, the option is never a very big loss actually. But uh, think of it uh, this way. You know, sometimes making money is not the only criteria for the auctioneer. So, the particular to be happier to be in this kind of value. That's why, but anyway, he was going to pay 28 in the year. So, he should release it out in the property of the company. More or less, he would have been here. Not really actually. So, anyway, think of it this way. If I, as a government, want to allocate land or any kind of resource to people, it should truly really go to who wants it the most, okay? Who's valuing it the most? Okay. So in that sense, I want to gather data. I want to gather true data about how much people are valued. One of the places where this kind of thing happens the most is what's called the spectrum auction, right? The radio spectrum auction. So when Airtel, Vodafone, and all of these large carriers want to come to market. They have to block out certain frequency spectrum for their data. So if everybody, if every mobile in the world is broadcasting at the same frequency, you know, nobody can hear anything. It's completely crowded. Right? So you need to block this out. You need to allocate frequency spectrum to these vendors. And these vendors should be and you know, screw up the audience. So you need to watch all this. So not exactly this, but you know, they have better markets. But this is the idea. So we are almost at the end. Where else is game theory used? These are a few good examples. But there are a lot more really good examples. These are in fact more more It just it take a lot of time to explain. To explain that. So one is in politics, you know. If only one nation has uh, nuclear arms, it can, you know, threaten another nation. But if two nations have nuclear arms, they're at equilibrium in fast statement where if you launch your nukes, I'm going to launch my nukes immediately. I have a detection system where if it detects a huge amount of you know, activity taking place in your nations immediately, my nukes. If you threaten to destroy me, I will mutually make sure that you are destroyed. So this is called mutually assured destruction. This is a stalemate at which many countries are there today. Okay? There is a lot of tension between nuclear nations. Why is it one guy in bombing? Because the other guy is also equally ready. As soon as he launches the nukes, these can be modeled as games. And <laughs> be very clear, these are not fun. Okay? These games do not have fun in them. So games need to be fun. But games are really good models for strategic inventions. Another thing is uh, what's called as evolutionary games. In, in biology, how uh, Individual behaves is interesting in the sense that you can model evolution as a kind of game where the person is playing against the environment, where okay, animals are competing against each other. You know, if you see the National Geographic and other things, when mating season comes to males, so males, uh, like the deers in those things, and they'll fight out. And, uh, peacocks have a huge display of their nice feathers. And some birds sing, and you know, a lot of signaling goes on to find the best way. Right? All of that can be modeled. And city planning, this is a beautiful example of it. It's called a brace paradox. If you go home and Google this, you will be kind of on the stuff. You know, you'll, you'll spend a few hours looking into this. It turns out that building new roads doesn't actually decrease traffic in all situations. There are certain situations where if you build a new road, that net delay in traffic actually increases. Very counterintuitive. How can that happen? There is more resource being fed into the system. You know, more lanes are open. People can travel better. So it turns out there is a beautiful example where it is shown that traffic actually increases sometimes when you launch something. 
point, you should take a look at this if uh, this interest in this kind of thing. A few nice questions open for you. No? He has a... Okay, he still has time. But, uh, we want to discuss about uh, things. Any questions can be asked. And, uh, yes. Does anybody have any questions regarding this thing or anything? Okay. <clears throat> The, you know, when, uh, when one person starts asking a question, another may want to ask another question. There is a certain momentum that creates. So yeah, the first person who ventures to ask the question, when you say game theory is an, uh, inter theory is an intersection between economic and computer science. Yeah. Well, we have never came across between computer science. So auctions, it's economics, economics, sponsored search options, computer science. Mm -hmm. Only those things. Or so more but they should be equal intersection means same amount of economics and competition. No, no, intersection doesn't mean intersection means so when I said that I meant it as a loose sense, okay, this came out as a study of you know where you can use a lot of sense of Pure economists also study okay? And there is a lot of computer scientists who are working on the other. So there is a new subject called algorithmic. They use, they use design PMs using algorithms and design mechanisms using algorithms and try to prove a person. So in that sense, it need be equal. Right? You can't really quantify how much of computer science is going in, how much of economics is going in. A lot of examples need a lot of rigorous uh, analysis. Okay? Because uh, you know a lot of such end baby explanations won't really give you the true intuition. So I urge you to go look at the MCA, explore So you will find a lot of better examples. But yeah, as far as you are concerned, it is certainly a topic of the same Exactly. Anyone? I have a few questions. But you have it. It's not just related to the MCA, but you are in general if you want to ask something about the MCA. Yeah, you can do the expert work. Blocking can be a good strategy. If you know that I will never follow your blocks, what's a good thing to do? Exactly, you know that. Yeah. There, is, there are no blanket statements, alright? This thing will always work, this thing will never work. It's all here to bed. Blocking is a good strategy. In fact, a lot of games are there. Long game, and there is hard to make part of the game. You are supposed to play. <laughs> so yeah. Any other questions? Have you noticed this? A lot of parts, pieces, and everything. All the ice cream vendors are in one place. Generally, they are all adult here. They could be spread out, right? Why, why is it not so Why are all the global shops in one place of Different, different flavors. <laughs> 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 but lastly, let's say that they are all selling the same thing. More or less. Have you ever been to explore? Yeah, they are so many electronics. Most of them are in one road. So why is that? They such a huge city. Every electronic vendor wants to be in I mean, you know, like, let's say there are only two vendors in this world. They are both consumers. They take more for the market. So more people do. Yeah, it makes sense. There are so many consumers that when they come, in a world, they come there, they never have any It's good company. But when, let, let's model it more vigorously. So what do we do by modeling? We simplify the whole process. Let us take up uh, just two vendors and just one part. Okay, it's a one-dimensional part. Okay, so our parts are generally two dimensions. Well, three dimensions. But yeah, okay. Let's say it's a one-dimensional part. Okay? There is one end here. There is another end here. Ideally, let us say we will go to the nearest ice cream vendor. 
there are two vendors A and B. Okay. Both of them sell the same kind of ice cream. They have only one flavor. Okay. They sell at the same cost. They are homogeneous. Does that mean? It means that everything is the same amount, except for the ingredients. One is actually the other one. Okay. Apart from that, doesn't matter which ice cream you want. If that is the case, what is the uh, ideal thing? If every customer just goes to the nearest person, how do you ensure that? So, okay, if one guy is somewhere here, let's say he is here, what's the best thing for you to do? Like, so, if a person is here, he goes to here. Okay? If B comes here, he goes to B. Because B is closer. If a person is standing here, he goes to the closest one. He goes to it. Otherwise, uh, yeah, he doesn't go to it. Because he is farther away. Let us say the condition for buying an ice cream is that he moves to the closest one. Okay? Given such a condition, given such a behavior, and given the fact that A is here, what is the best place for B to be? <coughs> Here? Two or three? Four answers. You are saying No, why? Everybody to the left of this board would be everybody to the right of this Instead, what you can do is, if you are here, all of these people definitely come to you because A is part of it. All of these people may want to, you know, they want to A, and all of these people would be. Can you do better than this? Shift to the right. Okay? Come here. Right? All of these people come to you and here it gets pretty. So what's the best thing to do? B, yeah. Right close next to A. Exactly, as close to together as possible. So B will be just beside it. Okay? So that everybody can go to B. Nobody wants to walk that extra step to go to <laughs> So yeah, but A is also smart. Okay? He look at you there, he will move two steps. A will come here. Okay. So what is B? B
Any questions regarding anything?